Morgan Stanley, the world's biggest brokerage by advisor count, has dropped out of an industry agreement that allows financial advisors to leave their firms for competing firms without getting sued. In a statement yesterday, the company said, over time, the protocol has become replete with opportunities for gamesmanship and loopholes. In its current state, the protocol is no longer sustainable. The bank will now focus less on recruitment and more on internal development. It's the latest move meant to slow Wall Street's revolving door for financial advisors. Joining us with more is David Bonson, Chief Investment Officer of the Bonson Group and former wealth advisor at Morgan Stanley. David, you left. Was this the reason why? Well, uh, basically, I think this is the latest move in an ongoing, very serious attempt by all of the big firms to disintermediate the advisor from their clients. And don't and understand, Morgan Stanley has some extremely smart and very good people there, but ultimately, this doesn't have anything to do with stopping competition with the other big firms. The Merrill Lynch's, Morgan Stanley's, and UBS's all just trade off with each other. They're all running in place. They lose a couple and gain a couple. This has everything to do with the revolving door of, of advisors leaving the big firms like Morgan Stanley to go into the independent model, the fiduciary model, which of course is what, what I happen to do. What's better for the individual investor and even for the institutional investor if there is more competition? Does that mean more competition on fees? Well, it certainly means more competition on fees, but it also means advisors that have a more o open architecture platform with which to serve them. So I think to the extent that advisors have greater choices available in how they serve the investing public, that's a win-win for everybody. Um, to the extent that the firms want to threaten their own advisors with lawsuits if they were to leave, I don't think that goes a long way to building a culture of freedom and of sort of encouraging that advisor-client relationship, the investing public benefits from greater choice. David, is Merrill, the likes of Merrill and UBS, I mean, are they going to follow suit? Oh, I would have to think that they would. I obviously don't have any knowledge of that. They have not yet released anything publicly, I should be clear. But I imagine this is, as it always has been, a zero-sum game and that everybody has sort of been waiting for one actor to make the first move. In this case, Morgan Stanley, as a leader in the big firm brokerage, struck first. But there would be no reason for Merrill or UBS or Wells Fargo to sit back and allow their advisors to go to Morgan, but not vice versa. Eventually, I think that's what you're seeing. But it's being prompted by the massive market share these firms are losing to the independent fiduciary model. This is the way that they can attempt to try to stop that. Uh, I, I think it's a very bad idea for them. I think a lot of advisors are happy at those firms and are not going to respond well to basically their own firm threatening to sue them. And David, I mean, you moved to independence 30 months ago. How's business? Uh, well, it, it was a great move for us, and, and this is a lot of the reason why I have so much confidence that a move like this isn't going to stop the movement. We left Morgan Stanley. I was a managing director there for a number of years and had a wonderful experience there, and we were managing a little over $600 million, and we're now managing over $1.2 billion. And as you said, that's in 30 months. This is the opportunity that exists for advisors when they come into greater freedom, greater autonomy, and a fiduciary standard of care. The investing public wants that fiduciary standard. We've doubled our business in 30 months. Now, in fairness, though, and congratulations on that, David, you were recognized by Barron's as one of the top 1,200 advisors, both in 2014 and 2015, times during which you were at the likes of UBS and Morgan Stanley. So you were able to build up a track record and a reputation that was bestowed upon you partially by the fact that you were at these houses. How do we cater to quality control if there isn't a, a, a route to independence? 
Well, I think that this is where a lot of these firms now, and of course, I'll tout the one I'm affiliated with, Hightower Advisors, but there are other competitors in the marketplace that are providing incredible resources to the independent channel. So corner office advisors at the big firms like myself in past decades didn't necessarily have that option, as you said, that path into independence where the resources were available for them to run a high quality business, meeting the needs of sophisticated affluent investors. But the high towers of the, the world, and like I said, the competitors that exist in that space have made it extremely possible for advisors to be able to better serve their clients and not only not forfeit any resources, but gain significant amount of choice in an open architecture environment. But it strikes me that in that case, the idea that moving to independence and therefore having independence of thought and not being with a thundering herd, for example, that that's taken away in some senses if there's these massive groups of independent advisors. Well, these groups, though, function completely differently. That's the key issue, is that each team still, each uh, independent advisor operates independently. They have their own choice about their custodians. They have their own choice about investment products and solutions. They have their own choice about technology resources and platforms with which they may serve. So it's fundamentally different in basically every category. What you have is a back-end resource provider providing you the tools necessary to serve your clients but without any of the bureaucracy and out any, without any of the dictums as to how you have to go about doing it. And in the process, you're free to function as a fiduciary, which I think is the, the key issue for the investing public. David, I mean, the protocol for broker recruiting has nearly 1,700 members. What happens to the agreement now? It's a great question because I don't know what will be in the best interest of a lot of the smaller members of the protocol going forward. Um, of course, there was a lot of movement from firm to firm in our industry before there ever was such thing as protocol. And my historical understanding of this is that it was Merrill Lynch who sort of helped create the system whereby firms would have the ability to more easier recruit from each other. It was almost a recognition that it was a zero-sum game. We're going to lose a few to you. You're going to lose a few to us. Let's just make it easier to do so instead of spending all our time in court. The advisors are going to have their clients come mm. to them when the, when the clients have been well served by that advisor. So does this mean the end of the protocol? It would not surprise me, but I don't know exactly how that will play out. It will be interesting to see. David, what's the pipeline like for advisors? Has it been on the decline, particularly among younger people? Well, that's a, the young people is a very interesting aspect here. I think it's one of the reasons why the firms like what Morgan Stanley's done are so willing now to sort of take a step back from the recruiting. It's first of all very expensive. A number of the firms out of the financial crisis uh, handcuffed themselves with very inexpensive and non-economically advantageous deals. And now I think they're saying enough of this. So let's let's sort of peel that back a little. So I think that there will be less of that recruiting, and and it will be more driven by advisors finding the right home for them to serve their clients. I think that will be the landscape we find ourselves in. Fascinating discussion. Thank you to David Banson of the Banson Group and congratulations.